dear colleagues, researchers, students, family members of David, ladies and gentlemen. As the Dean of the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering here at Ghent University, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you officially to the inaugural lecture of the International Colon Frankie Chair, 2022-2023, an international Frankie Chair given to Professor David Ellsworth. Professor Ellsworth is awarded for his expertise on the science of climate change and land surface climate interactions across temperate as well as tropical regions. This inaugural lecture is the start of a vibrant scientific program developed by Kent University in collaboration with six Belgian partner universities, including the universities of Antwerp, Brussels, Jean Blou, Louvain la Neuve. The program is aimed to inform you and young researchers about research and at the same time it also aims to inform everyone on the management of natural capital under climate change. In addition, the program also wants to inspire you and it aims to connect you with other scientists. Before starting the inaugural lecture, I want to acknowledge the Franqui Foundation. The Franqui Foundation that enabled this program. The Franqui Foundation promotes the development of higher education and scientific research. In this especially in Belgium, but it also encourages inter-university cooperation. And I think this event is a very nice example. It's a very nice example, one of the many initiatives that are promoted by the Foundation. On behalf of Ghent University and all partner universities, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Franqui Foundation, and I would like to welcome Professor Nick Schamp member of the advisory board of the Franqui Foundation to explain us a little bit more about the foundation, what are their aims and their ambitions. So therefore, I invite Professor Schamp on the floor. Mrs. Dean, Professor Ellsworth, Professor Verbeek, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it was a pretty surprise and an honor to be invited for this introduction to the Franqui Foundation. The more so, while it is a wonderful story, starting in the dark years of World War I. Belgium was neutral in 1914, but Germany still invaded it in the beginning of August of that year, and six weeks later, they were at the western edge of Belgium between the sea and the frontier of France. And then the miracle occurred. The valley of the river Eiser was intentionally flooded with water from the sea and the mighty German army was stopped and never got any further during the following four years. Brave little Belgium, they said. But 90% of Belgium was occupied by the Germans and they took anything they could use, machines, metals like copper, and food. After two months, 
it was clear that a terrible famine would come about. And then Emile Franchi, Emile Franchi went to the American ambassador for help. As you know, America was not involved in that war until 1917. Who was Franchi? Franchi was a Brussels boy, born in 1863, an orphan living with his grandmother, and at age 14, he went to the military school, made a career in the army, but left it at age 32 for the diplomatic service. There he was sent to China in order to promote Belgian firms for the expansion of the railway system in China. After a few years, he came back and went into banking. And in 1914, at age 51, he was the administrator of the largest bank in Belgium, an important person then. So in September 14, he went to the ambassador in Brussels and then the ambassador in London, and this man called on Hoover. Hoover. Who is Hoover? Herbert Hoover, the later president of the United States, was a mine engineer, and he was known for his extraordinary organizing capacities. In 14, he was 40 and had already made a fortune in the mining industry in Australia. Frankie and Hoover knew each other as in China they had been competitors. But now they understood each other very well on the problem in what was now known as poor little Belgium. And they started a decades-long collaboration. Hoover created in America the Commission for Relief in Belgium, the CRB, and Franqui started with his friends from the big companies in Brussels, the National Aid and Food Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, this became by far the largest humanitarian action in the world up to then. In four years, they shipped five to six million tons of food and clothes to Belgium, bought all over the world with the $900 million of donations. Donations by governments, but also by private citizens, mostly Americans. Hoover did the marketing and the deals. Franqui organized the distribution in Belgium. It was not an easy task, though, as, as we said, the Germans took the food. Well, uh, Hoover had to, uh, had to uh, tell the, had an agreement with the Germans that they should not touch this food while it was the property of the CRB, an American company, until it was in the hands of the Belgian citizens. The British, on the other hand, blocked all transport to Germany and the occupied countries, so he had to make an agreement as well with them to give free passage to his ships. These activities, which had an enormous impact on the life in Belgium, were stopped in 1920, two years after the war. But in the books of the CRB, $34 million were left. $34 million, that's about 500 million in actual dollars. And then Hoover and Franke made two decisions. One, the remaining money has been meant for the Belgians and should be used for the Belgians. Two, in agreement with the Belgian authorities, it should be applied for the promotion of science research as the driving force of the economy. A remarkable decision at the moment of still much poverty in Belgium. First of all, they helped 
universities in the startup after the war. Then they created the Belgian American Educational Foundation, which is still a thriving organization for the exchange of young scientists between America and Belgium. Up to now, it sent more than 5,000 young Belgians to the U.S. for further formation. A much larger part of the money was put in the University Foundation, which is still the main meeting place of professors and scientists in Brussels. In 1927, King Albert I made an urgent request for more support of scientific research, and in 1928, the National Fund for Scientific Research was set up, which was strongly supported by the University Foundation, as it was by companies such as Solvay and others. Now it is divided in a Flemish and a French-speaking part, which are both still the most important support for scientific research, mostly with public money, though, now, really. But that was not the end of the CRB money. In 1932, Hoover, who was then the President of the United States, thought that his brother-in-arms deserved a fund with his name. They created the Franke Foundation. First of all, this new foundation set up the Franke Prize, still the highest prize for research in Belgium. Then they wanted to promote the collaboration of professors and universities by awarding Franke chairs, both within Belgium and, and internationally, David. And recently, the activities of the Franke Foundation have been broadened towards support for research professors, postdocs, startups, fellowships, symposia, etc. For the colleagues who might be interested, all the details are available on the website of the Foundation. Maybe you have seen that the international chair we are inaugurating today is not a Franqui chair, but a Colin Franqui chair. Who is Colin? Professor Desiree Colin is a colleague of our sister university of Leuven. He's a medical doctor and a chemist, and was and still is a very successful researcher and entrepreneur. At age 37 already, he was granted a patent for the production of TPA. That's a medicine that can dissolve blood clots, which can, can cause heart attack or brain infarction. With the royalties, Professor Colin created his own foundation, which, among many other things, collaborates with the Franqui Foundation for these chairs and also for awarding two new prizes in medicine. And this collaboration gave our colleague Hans Verbeek the possibility of inviting Professor David Ellsworth, who is, as you heard, a top research researcher on climate change. We wish, we wish both of you all possible success in this so important field, climate change, presumably the number one problem on our dear planet, Earth. Professor Elspeth, it's a real pleasure to hand over the Franqui Medal to you. Congratulations.
sitting around and maybe you are in need and let it interfere.
it's just maybe too good to be true. Maybe to shine when the nobles are coming by, maybe to craft it to lose. The night floating away, maybe to true to be gold, maybe to proud of the beauty she shouts out loud, maybe to craft it to lose. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on my term also uh, turn a warm welcome to all of you colleagues and friends and a special thanks to our Dean Els van Damme and Professor Schamp for their uh, introductions today and also a special thanks to uh, Siun and Jeroen for uh, the music today. Um, I want to welcome you also in name of all uh, co-promoters of this Frankie chair because I'm promoting this Colin Franqui chair uh, together with the team of these uh, seven Belgian universities and uh, these uh, co-promoters are, are sitting here uh, in the second uh, row of the room today. And um, I think it's a great honor for me and also for the other co-promoters to introduce Professor David Ellsworth uh, to you. And uh, I'm very pleased pleased that we finally can have this inaugural lecture because it was originally planned two years ago but due to this pandemic we had to postpone it several times. Uh, David was kind of locked in Australia and he, he was not even allowed to leave the country. But finally uh, we are here uh, today and I want to take this opportunity David to congratulate you very much in name of all uh, co-promoters. Um, and let me briefly introduce some of the highlights of uh, the CV, the impressive CV of David Ellsworth. He studied in, at the University of Cornell in the United States quite some years ago. Um, and after finishing that study, he uh, continued uh, with the research with a PhD in tree physiology which he finished in 1991 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, also in the United States. And that was the start of his scientific career, which uh, took place uh, in two parts, I would say. First, 15 years in the US, and then he moved uh, to Australia. He worked at different, multiple universities uh, in the US, uh, ending up in Michigan in 2006, if I'm correct, because in 2007, David moved to uh, Australia to become a professor at the Hawkesbury Institute of Environment as part of the University of Western Sydney, where he is still one of the leading scientists today. It has, has already been said that uh, David's expertise is in climate change and in land surface climate interactions. He has published many studies in top journals like Nature and Nature Climate Change. He is one of the highly cited researchers in the field of ecology and the field of environmental sciences. David is most famous 
for his work on the impact of elevated CO2, so the increase of atmospheric CO2 concentration on ecosystems on the land, uh, for which he uses the so-called phase experiments. David will tell you all about it uh, during his lecture within a few minutes. We as promoters have proposed David as a candidate for this chair um, because he's a leading scientist dedicated to understand our changing Earth system. He contributed significantly to our understanding of our planet with excellent work on fundamental processes like photosynthesis. Photosynthesis under climate change. And he has been measuring photosynthesis on leaves of trees for many, many years. He has been climbing trees for many years. He has done that for uh, temperate forests in the United States. He has been climbing tropical trees in the Amazon. And he's now still measuring photosynthesis on eucalyptus trees down under in Australia. But on top of that detailed work on individual leaves and understanding this very basic process of photosynthesis and how it's impacted by climate change, he is also studying forests and ecosystems at a larger scale, what we call the ecosystem scale. Um, and he is uh, focusing on multiple uh, aspects of that ecosystem scale works. He's in work. He's interested in nutrient cycling, in the impact of increased droughts, but also the functional diversity of ecosystems. And most importantly, he has taken the challenge to study those multiple global change factors together, because it's very complex. Temperatures are rising nowadays, CO2 is increasing, Droughts are becoming more frequent, and all these factors together are impacting our forests, our grasslands. And uh, David is studying those interactions which large, with large-scale experiments. David's impressive track record has made him a world-recognized researcher, but in, in addition to that, he also contributed a lot to academic capacity building. He has been training lots of students, of young researchers that did uh, their uh, PhD or postdoc under David's supervision. And I think that's also a very important uh, contribution. Moreover, Professor Ellsworth is doing important efforts to communicate his results to the wider public. And he has been featured uh, presenting his insights and results uh, in, in uh, international media multiple times. I am also very proud to introduce uh, this lecture in name of the natural capital platform of the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering here in Ghent. What is natural capital? Our natural capital is the total of the world's reserves in natural resources. So this includes all the soils on Earth, which we call the pedosphere, all the water on Earth, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. The biosphere are all the living ecosystems in the ocean and, the, and on the land. And this natural capital is providing to us what we call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is what nature gives to society. And examples of such ecosystem services are the water we drink, the food we, ate, we eat, but also materials like wood to make constructions, but also services like climate stabilization or CO2 uptake or outdoor recreation. And these ecosystem services are currently highly under pressure worldwide due to human activities and the human-induced climate change uh, that we are currently experiencing. And there is a large imbalance between the high rate at which we are exploiting our natural capital versus the low level at which we are valuing the natural capital in our human society by our policies and in our economic system. And the natural capital research platform at our faculty 
is a multidisciplinary research platform that aims to resolve some of these societal challenges related to natural capital by doing research and developing tools to um, map and understand, to manage and also to value these ecosystem services and how they are impacted by uh, climate change. About 30 professors and more than 100 researchers are part of this platform and many of them are present in the room today. And um, their expertise is spanning from soil science over agronomy, hydrology, ecology, up to expertise in ecosystem valuing by uh, socioeconomic scientists. And by using this unique combination of expertise, we as a platform want to raise awareness. We want to do interdisciplinary research. Uh, we want to be an independent think tank. And um, we want to connect and mobilize stakeholders. Uh, these stakeholders, with stakeholders I mean non-academic stakeholders like companies, policy makers, and people from NGOs. We want to connect with them to bring our uh, knowledge or research into practice, but also to get inspired to make our, our research more useful for society. And I'm also happy to see that a few of these non-academic uh, stakeholders are also present in this aula today. Before I give the floor to David, I want to say a few words on the scientific program of this Frankie chair. David did not come to Belgium just for this inaugural lecture uh, today. Now he is here, here for six months to develop an intense research program together with the seven partner universities. And we have also developed a series of what we call classes of excellence for 40 young researchers. These 40 researchers are mostly PhD students and postdocs from many different countries in the world, but they are all doing their research in one of the seven Belgian participating uh, universities. And this morning, we had the first class of excellence uh, led by David by, uh, uh, as an introduction class. And in the coming, so in the coming months, we will, um, David will do a little tour around Belgium actually, and because we have planned six more of these uh, classes of excellence. And at each day of such a class of excellence, we will work with that group of 40 uh, students, uh, but we will also organize other activities. Each university, uh, organizes, for example, a field visit or a public lecture by David and so on. And these 40 researchers, which are also uh, present here in the room, will to work together with David in the coming months to develop a vision on natural capital and natural capital research, which we will uh, present in a scientific publication, but we will also present it at the closing symposium on the 8th of December here in Ghent, two representatives of uh, funding agencies, uh, science funding agencies in Belgium, but also Europeans, uh, European funding agencies, in the hope to push the natural capital research in the best possible direction for the coming uh, decade, inspired by the ideas of these uh, 40 young uh, researchers. So we have a lot of work uh, to do in the coming uh, six months, and I'm looking forward uh, to that. And with that, I want to thank the Franqui Foundation once more for this great opportunity, and I will leave the floor to David, uh, and I hope you will all enjoy his uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. And um, thank you to the co-promoters who've come here today and to those who could not be here today. It's really a pleasure to finally meet you and to be out of Australia. And um, it's wonderful to be here and to be able to present to you in person rather than online. 
So it's a great pleasure. Thank you to those who have attended from the university and thank you to the University of Kent for your f fantastic organization to be able to both get me here, but also to be able to make this lecture come true. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I also want to thank the Frankie Foundation as well for giving me the opportunity to come here. And uh, perhaps I'll tell you a little story, but later on if I get a chance. Um, today, my title is To Save or Squander, How Shall We Manage Our Natural Capital? I first want to start with a word of welcome, warami, which is the Daruk word for welcome. Many of you may never have heard an Aboriginal word. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work in, in Eastern Australia, which is the land of the Dauru. Their bloodline for 50,000 years has managed and maintained that part of Eastern Australia, including the Blue Mountains in which I live. And I'm grateful to those traditional owners for having tended the land for that over the millennia. Um, now I'd like to take you to a different era, which is the Romantic era. And I want to give you a picture of humans and nature. The Romantic era was in the late 18th century. And the Romantic era was also about the time that Australia was colonized by Europeans. And in that era, which represented an era just after the Enlightenment that put together ideals of art, music, but also science and rationalism, this movement, the Romantic movement, which occurred around then, um, is partly the origination of many of the ideas that we have concerning humans and nature. So the Romantic era really viewed nature as something apart from humans, as an ideal, and in part, the concepts of that era pervade science and society, art, music, literature, and so forth, on through today. And the Romantic era and the concepts of the Romantic era involved humans apart from nature, a pure nature, and also the idea that humans and their influence of civilization would taint nature. And so the great thinker Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that humans and human civilization will inflict nature with evil, is the thinking behind it. So um, this thinking I'm going to contend to you is obsolete and we need to do away with this mode of thinking. And so for many of you, I will bring you into the modern era. But first I'll start with um, the early plant geographers and their ideas, which emerged at that time of the Romantic era. Alexander von Humboldt, Augustin de Candolle, and other early plant scientists brought about the con concept that climate influenced vegetation. And in particular, um, Humboldt had the idea that tree lines on mountaintops were forced to a particular elevation by a very harsh climate at higher elevation. So trees couldn't grow any higher than that. And in fact, Von Humboldt also brought forward the idea of that zonation of vegetation through the alpine zone down through to the tropical zone. And indeed, Von Humboldt worked in the Amazon as I did in my early training days and probably experienced many of the similar things to which I experienced. In fact, in the village that I worked in, uh, it's said that around 1802, von Humboldt sat there racked with yellow fever and never moved forward into the great kingdom of Portugal or Brazil at, at that time. 
If we move a bit forward, that paradigm that was established by those thinkers of the Romantic era was that nature is buffeted in a sea of change. Nature is forced by climate change. And you can see that really in this summer in Flanders, as well as what comes out in the media. And so this old paradigm really pervades our perspective on climate change right now. So I'm going to give you a little view of a few articles that have been in the news recently. Arctic warming happening faster than we thought. China's drought. The summer in 2021 was the warmest. Of course, that's out the window because we've had another summer that's the warmest, perhaps. Fires in Greece, Morocco, and elsewhere. And the heat wave in the Loire in France. And last, shortages of um, water here in Flanders. And all of these ideas are really telling us that climate change is forcing changes in our vegetation. And it is indeed doing so. But I want to again take you away from that old way of thinking, which I will do very shortly. Let's look carefully at climate change. 15 of the past, 15 of the hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2000. And here we see a concurrence of the rise in atmospheric CO2 and global temperatures. Global temperatures are shown here and CO2 is shown here. And these are the years through the 20th century in, in, up to the present. And the temperature is expressed, of course, as an anomaly from an average from about the uh, period from the 1950 to 1980 period. So what you see is a tremendous concurrence of the rise in atmospheric CO2 and the rise in global temperatures as well. That concurrence lies in a set of other recent trends as well that I can describe to you. The uh, rise in population, again, a graph shown from 1860 through to 2000, the rise in population shown in blue. Concurrent with that, the rise in CO2 is the black dashed line. And concurrent with that, a rise in nitrogen loading due to the use of fertilizers. And of course, the rise in temperature, which is the red dotted line. These are integrally linked to one another because as our population grows, we rely on fossil fuels. We emit those fossil fuels into the atmosphere. We need to feed our population so we have intense pressure on nitrogen fertilizers. And those fertilizers are very heavily used in agriculture to be able to produce, which puts reactive nitrogen up into the atmosphere as an even stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, thus further forcing climate. So we have three or four of these trends that are integrally linked to one another and that have changed through time. Some have thus named this age the Anthropocene. The era when human activities have had such a significant global impact that they've affected Earth's physical and biological systems to a huge extent. And we have countless examples of the importance of that. But again, let's not think so negatively and let's consider that those romantic ideas that came out and were promulgated by people like von Humboldt and let's now say they are obsolete. Those ideas are impediments to being able to move forward and to create a sustainable society. We are not sitting in tension with nature and apart from nature. We are sitting within nature. We are part of it. And that means 
as a positive picture on climate change, we have an opportunity. In fact, the way that we should really think about it is in terms of bi-directionality. It is not just climate that is influencing vegetation, but rather vegetation that can also influence gases in the atmosphere and thus influence our climate. So this is a two-way street. This is not a one-way street. Those old ideas of the Romantic era need to go because we need to consider that our land vegetation is both affected by CO2 emissions and atmospheric CO2, but can also take up that carbon dioxide and mitigate CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And thus, it's a two-way street. And that two-way street means that we may have opportunities into the future. Now, there's been a very broad scientific effort amongst thousands of scientists worldwide to close the uncertainties of the land carbon sink and understand these effects of atmospheric CO2, but also effects of climate. And what we show here, this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the, um, the fifth report from the Working Group 1, that there are both um, positives and negatives, that the land carbon response to CO2 is to actually increase productivity, and the land carbon response to climate is a, um, believed to be a net negative. And the dots here indicate the uncertainty amongst the very variety of models that have been run. So we have both a positive and a negative influence of that accumulation of atmospheric CO2. Let me put it another way to show you how important our land carbon sink is. Shown here is a time course from 1850 to 2019. Everything above that axis represents an emission out to the atmosphere, currently running at about, um, I believe it's 11 and a half uh, metric tons per annum. Right up there, the majority of which is due to fossil fuel emissions. And on this side, we have a quantity of that carbon that's emitted that's soaked up by the oceans, a quantity that's soaked up by the soil and the plants, and a quantity that stays into the atmosphere, and that is the um, greenhouse gas emissions that remain in the atmosphere and accumulate and have radiative forcing properties. But imagine the CO2 going into the atmosphere without green plants. If we didn't have the influence of green plants, that red zone would become enormous and there would be a huge forcing. So our land vegetation is already doing quite a lot for us. In fact, we would have a worse global problem due to fossil fuel emissions by about a third if we didn't have plants absorbing CO2 back. And this is part of our natural capital that we rely on, that we need to retain, and that we can actually enhance. So that's one of the ideas from today's lecture that I would like you to take back home. I'm gonna talk about some of my research and research that's done with colleagues and collaborators shown here and here on plant processes to take up CO2 from the atmosphere. And I'm going to start this part by talking about manipulation or push experiments. This is the theme of the classes of excellence that as um, Hans indicated that we're delivering throughout our uh, co-sponsor universities in Belgium. These manipulation or push experiments make a step change in a factor. And here I'll give you an example from carbon dioxide, where in experiments we make a step change or a push, and we want to then observe the response. It's very simple. A pulse here 
and we want to see what the response is. And for atmospheric CO2, with the rise of 200 parts per million or 150 parts per million that we've done in many, many experiments, and not just me, but many predecessor scientists have done these experiments, with that push in carbon dioxide, the expectation has been that productivity will increase. So not only have plants historically been doing a job to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for us for free, thus mitigating the damaging effects of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the expectation is that they will continue to do so into the future, much along what's indicated here by the blue line. And many, many experiments have demonstrated that. And I'll talk about that again in just a moment. But there's more than just CO2 involved in these push experiments. So shown here are a few different drought enclosures in experiments. We do these push experiments because there's a long history of them in science, actually mapping back to experiments that were done by the great thinkers of the Enlightenment. We do these experiments because they have a strong statistical basis that allows us a high degree of confidence to understand how the factors that we've manipulated have affected the processes we wanted to observe. We do these experiments because we have a strong control or a baseline, and therefore we could perturb the system and know with confidence that that's the factor that has caused the effects that we wanted to see. And that gives us strong inference with strong cause-effect connections. So scientifically, there's high value in doing these manipulation experiments. They're also costly, logistically difficult to do, and often a great scientific effort among a very large group of scientists. And so shown here are a set of manipulation or push experiments where rainfall is decreased by putting a roof over the vegetation or high-tech chambers are put around vegetation to grow it at a warmer temperature. Or here from the um, uke face experiment that I lead in Western Sydney. And all of these are part of the experimental protocol that we use to determine what are the impacts on vegetation, but also to help us to understand that two-way street of how vegetation will feed back on the atmosphere as well. So I'll give you a few examples from um, the variety of research that's been done. First, in terms of experimental warming, because it's so critical now and moving into the future as we're seeing intensifying temperatures in many parts of the world. These experiments can be done at the very small scale. Here's a uh, leaf heating experiment done in the Australian tropics by Christine Cruz. Here's a colleague in America, Peter Reich, doing a warming experiment of plots using infrared heaters. In this case, then seedlings are being warmed. And our own experiments using large tree chambers with a controlled environment around trees that we can have a warmed environment as well as a control. And what have we been finding in those experiments? Well, we grew a particular eucalypt Tasmanian blue gum in these tree chambers, and we had a six-day heat wave. Now, I've seen heat waves here. Our heat waves in Western Sydney, um, that's six consecutive days topping 38 degrees C, and in fact, uh, the warmest at 40 um, for this particular heat wave. Um, when that heat wave, on the first day of that heat wave, this is the way that a number of trees looked in this experiment. And by the ninth day, after temperatures had cooled off to about 25 degrees C, you can see the effects that killed those trees. Very remarkable in some sense and probably unsurprising to many of you. Um, but what we have learned is more important from these experiments. We've learned how to manage the heat. And shown here are pictures from another heat wave in uh, 
Western Sydney in Penrith, Australia, as well as uh, Tree by the Lay here in Kent this summer. And managing the heat will mean that we need to make appropriate species selections for plantings. We need to think for the future in the next 30 to 50 years when we make our plantings now. And I also want to highlight that we need to ensure a good soil substrate, so more than 30 centimeters wide, <laughs> I would imagine. Um, so these are some pictures from suburban Western Sydney. And we need to ensure that good soil substrate, and we also need to learn from failures. Our ability to learn from failures is what makes us unique as, as uh, organisms on this earth, and we should really use that knowledge when we think about subsequent plantings. And in fact, what I want to encourage is that we diversify plantings, particularly in urban environments, and learn from those failures to increase the diversity in those areas that are affected by heat waves. So that the heat wave is not just an impact, but an opportunity to diversify our plantings, keep the survivors, and plant other tree species in urban environments that can give back the amenities that we rely on, the shade and the cooling during heat waves and so forth. Sorry. I want to talk about the second push because that's been an area of research for me for a long time, which is the increase in atmospheric CO2 using the free air approach. And I've been involved in these free air CO2 experiments since the early 1990s. So almost the majority of my career, um, sorry, the majority of my career. Um, and that involves the computer controlled emission of CO2 from these so-called vent pipes that surround the vegetation. So the way that that works is that when the wind when there's a high wind speed, the CO2 is emitted upwind and the natural air takes that carbon dioxide across the plot, thus bathing the vegetation in a high CO2 environment so that we can understand how high CO2 affects the plots. Under calm conditions, the CO2 is emitted from every other pipes and this is a computer controlled system that needs to be mod modulated very rapidly in order to do it. Now, I've been involved in CO2 experiments of a variety and um, we have three basic expectations from these experiments that I'd like to illustrate to you now. The majority of the hypotheses have posited that plants will find resources and growth will increase according to this blue line. So when we increase the CO2 concentration suddenly, we expect an increase in the productivity of the vegetation soaking back a portion of that CO2 that we've emitted and that that can continue in the long term is the expectation from the majority of studies that have preceded me and even some of the ones that I've done. But we have now two new hypotheses or newer hypotheses. One of those where there's an early stimulation of productivity and growth amongst the vegetation but then a decline, and we, the hypothesis is that plants face increasing nutrient limitations over time. So as they're doused with high CO2 year after year, they're unable to maintain and sustain those growth increases, and we see these declines. And there's a strong feedback with the soil system that we're still understanding from those experiments. And the third prominent hypothesis is shown in green, which is the strong control by nutrients. So there's virtually no response of the vegetation to that increase in CO2. And that drives in stark contrast to the blue line. This is urgent information that we need because if our vegetation is already eliminating a third of the problem with atmospheric CO2, but that's all that it can do, that is crucial information that we need as a society in order to consider alternatives for management into the future. And so the uh, first experiment I was involved in from 
the um, early 1990s through to um, about 2003. And in this experiment, we exposed a pine plantation, a young pine plantation to high CO2. The high CO2 is shown in the red over time. We saw an early increase that was rather large in the productivity of that vegetation measured as the above ground woody growth. And then we saw that that subsided a bit over time. So that was equivalent to the um, scenario in brown that I showed in the previous slide here. And we believe that did result from plants facing increased nutrient limitation. In fact, we added nutrients back and the growth um, enhancement increased again. So we think we've uh, proven that as best can be. Um, now I'd like to take you to the UCFACE experiment in Western Sydney. This is an experiment that I'm the scientific leader of. I uh, drove the funding and the um, infrastructure build as well as the science team. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like as these um, set of pipes that surround vegetation as, a, as I indicated, it emits CO2 into the vegetation in a controlled fashion. Um, just to give you a little sense of what is involved in infrastructure in these experiments, um, we have 56 tons of trees that are exposed to high CO2 in this experiment, and that's 263 trees, and these are mature trees over 100 years old. The first time that's ever been done globally exposing trees of that age in an ecosystem, an intact ecosystem, to high atmospheric CO2. Until then, we've been wondering how our old forests might respond to high CO2. A few other numbers, the CO2 use at max can be about um, 2,000 kilograms per, or two tons of CO2 per hour. That sounds like a lot, and yes, it does cost $4 Australian per minute to run these experiments. Running them continually throughout the year is um, a costly endeavor, but a very an important one and a world first again in terms of what we've achieved at Uke Face. Um, I know that many of you will think, well, they're polluting the environment, and we are. You need to pollute the environment in order to study it. But the fraction of national CO2 emissions for Australia is not point triple not seven one percent. So it's a very small amount of natural CO2 emissions. And certainly, if one of our colleagues, like the large mining corporation BHP Billiton, were to close one of its mines, they would save a vast more amount of CO2 emissions than we ever achieve in this experiment. Um, a couple of other fun facts. There's seven kilometers of electrical wire and 17,000 volts and 96 tons of glass fiber that are sitting in the infrastructure that you see. So let me give you a view of um, that infrastructure and um, my thanks to Kim Calders who's worked at Uke Face over the past decade because uh, this is your work, Kim. Is a uh, terrestrial laser scan of the Uke Face Forest done by drone. You can see the infrastructure, the cranes, and those uh, 96 tons of glass fiber pipe here as we fly over Uke Face and give you a view of that experiment and the various trees within the experiment. So that's what Uke Face looks like. Thanks again, Kim. What have we found at Uke Face so far? We have found that leaf photosynthesis was increased by 38, was increased by 20% with a 38% increase in atmospheric CO2. So the elevated CO2 points are dark here, and you see that they always sit above the ambient CO2 points with our replication and everything else, our average response ratio is 20%. And that's over the first uh, five years of that experiment. 
When we looked at above ground net primary productivity, that didn't respond to CO2 though. So we have all this CO2 that's coming in via photosynthesis, but it's not showing up in terms of above ground productivity. So the ambient bars are shown in, in uh, the darker color of red, and the elevated bars are shown in uh, the pink color. And you can see over time, there is no difference between ambient and elevated CO2 in terms of this um, above ground net productivity. When we look at the wood component of that productivity, the growth of the trees, in fact, we also see no effect of CO2, but we do see interannual variability. So again, ambient is shown in the um, dark red and elevated in the light pink in this graphic. And what you can see is interannual variability, for instance, a cool wet year in 2017, warm dry years in 2018 and 2019, the trees almost didn't grow at all. Still, they did absorb a small amount of CO2 from the atmosphere on net, but uh, not as much growth as you would see in a wet year. 2020, of course, being a spe spectacularly wet year, and since then, 2021 and 2022 also quite wet in Sydney. So there's variation in the productivity and the growth in the wood, but still no CO2 response overall. So just to summarize what we've learned from CO2 experiments, I illustrated three hypotheses for what we might see in terms of the net primary productivity and effectively the carbon that's accrued over time. And there's strong control by nutrients and that overrules the CO2 response. So in previous studies, younger trees did show a strong CO2 response, which we did also observe in the pine experiments in America, but we haven't seen that in Uke Face. We believe from that that our current mature vegetation can store carbon from the atmosphere. And I don't want any of you to walk out here thinking, oh, they didn't store any carbon in, ele in the experiment. We do store carbon, but this is the added increment of carbon when we increase CO2. Our inference from this is the system might be saturated by CO2 with a very low nutrient availability in the soil. Now that becomes critical because that helps us to know where there might be a CO2 response to help us to unlock where we can store carbon and where we should not focus our efforts. And I'm not involved in this work at all. This is just an example from Shah et al where they showed what's called the carbon gap by these, um, the color spectrum shown here. And so where it's darker green, it, they believe according to their models that there's an opportunity for more carbon storage. And some of that information can carry forward in terms of future efforts. So um, while we need to refine models like this, what I do think is that our experiments have helped inform them and that will continue in the scientific process over years. So we talked about these recent trends that are aligned with one another and integrally linked. Our population growth is driving fossil fuel emission because we rely on fossil fuels still today, even here in Belgium. And um, we rely on nitrogen fertilizers for our crops and food that we eat and that these trends in terms of population, nitrogen, and CO2, and temperature are closely linked to each other. But what I would ask today in challenge to these ideas that our vegetation is buffeted by climate change, by a harsh climate change is, can we unlink these trends? Are there things that we can do where we can uncouple population growth from fossil fuel emissions, and what can we do in terms of the land base for this? And here I'd like to highlight nature-based climate solutions, um, of which there are many, that build our natural capital and help to uncouple these trends. So there are many approaches, and I'm not going to describe them all, but I'm just going to touch on them. 
They include urban greening that helps unlink population growth from land degradation. They include carbon sequestration plantings, restoration of our forests and wetlands to store CO2, and diversifying existing plantings as well, so to help make them more climate resilient. And I want to point out that these nature-based climate solutions do offer many co-benefits, which Hans also highlighted in his talk before mine. Co-benefits that might include habitat enhancement, air pollution mitigation, water filtration, and enhancement of biodiversity. So there are a lot of positives that are associated with these nature-based climate solutions. They're not the only solution to help unlink these trends. Relying on renewables to a greater degree is, of course, a very valuable endeavor, and many of us are engaged in that. But here I also want to highlight the things we can do with our land base that can help also store more carbon from the atmosphere in particular instances. Now, um, just to highlight these nature-based climate solutions and the options associated with them, there are a series of these options listed along here. You probably can't read them. Reforestation is one, natural forest management, avoided grassland conversion, and so forth. These carbon mitigation strategies also have to work within the economic constraints that we have. And so in this paper by Fargioni et al., they've illustrated um, four different cost scenarios. The lowest one at 10 US dollars per metric ton CO2 equivalent is really about the current market price for carbon anyhow. So if we can push above that current market price for carbon, we can achieve what's shown in these green bars in terms of climate mitigation potential by our um, different nature-based climate solution strategies. And in addition to that, there are many co-benefits that go along with that. The co-benefits in this particular study are highlighted by the colored bars here. And they would include, again, biodiversity, uh, uh, air pollution mitigation, and so forth. So these nature-based climate solutions may offer options, but we need to choose wisely between them, and we need to think about it in a rational sense along with the economic decisions that we need to make. So that's why I highlight here the different costings as well as the different options and the co-benefits because we need to think of this as a package in our management scenario and we certainly by information like this can better make the uh, key decisions that need to be made to ensure that we have as many co-benefits and win-win situations as can be in our investment for carbon mitigation. Now, let me take you 17,000 kilometers away to Australia. It's a climate exposed land. The um, old poem goes of drought and flooding rains, and we have seen drought and flooding rains in the past three years. We have seen the driest year on record for many locations within Australia in 2019. We have seen enormous bushfires, enormous bushfires in Australia in late 2019, early 2020, occurring alongside that drought. And then since then, this is a picture I took last November, um, which is the uh, start of the warm season in Australia. Uh, we've seen massive flooding. And in fact, Sydney itself has been flooded now three times just this year. So we have seen a lot of climate events. And I'd like to put to you that Australia can also learn to manage our natural capital in a sustainable way. Now, how have we managed our natural capital? Well, this is probably not the best way, but historically this is what has happened. And I want to point out in the last nine years or nine years from 2010 to 2018, about 15 times the area of Belgium has been removed each and every year in Australia. So this is the land clearing rate 
both for primary forest and re-clearing. So that's close to um, 3 million hectares removed in that nine year period in Australia. That is not the way to manage our natural capital because I can tell you it did not all go into buildings and get stored in structures and houses and so forth. So we need to think more rationally about these approaches and what we're doing. And I speak to you as Europeans because you have the potential to put pressure on my government um, to be able to see changes that you think follow your values. Um, here's a quote from our um, former foreign minister made at the Conference of Parties in Paris in 2015. Coal will remain critical to promoting prosperity, growing economies, and alleviating hunger for years to come. Now, when is the last time you ate coal? I have not ever in my life. And again, this is not a strategy that we should take. So I want to make a few scientific conclusions. The first is that our natural ecosystems do provide carbon offsets, and we get that carbon offset for free or almost for free. So our management can help encourage and enhance these carbon offsets with a very nominal investment, in fact. Climate change does pose threats to aspects of these offsets. Can, in particular, heat waves can cause tree death and the tree mortality problem has been highlighted worldwide along with heat and drought. So we need to understand that a bit better scientifically, but we know that poses a threat to our offsets and that diversification can help stabilize these systems. What we've learned from experiments can get put into practice for climate carbon offsets. So we have the potential then to use the science that we've learned from these push experiments that I described earlier to help us to understand these carbon offsets and work with them and be able to decouple those global trends of population and fossil fuel use and climate change. Rising CO2 in the future pushes some ecosystems to absorb more carbon, but not in nutrient-poor ecosystems. We learned that from our, our study in Western Sydney and Australia. So it started with this example of the Garden of Eden and the romantic idea of humans apart from nature. And what I want to tell you is that we were never removed from the Garden of Eden. We've lived in it always. The Garden of Eden is for us. It's for us to manage and enhance, and our natural capital remains a part of that. As we move into the future, I hope we move past that obsolete thinking of a Garden of Eden that we sit apart from, but rather that we sit within, and that we're part of that Garden of Eden means that we can affect the change that we want. Now, just a few closing thoughts. We don't live against nature. We live with it, and we live in it. The historic human nature tension that was set up in the early thinking of the Romanticism and the sum in the Enlightenment can impede progress. So we need to move past that conceptual mode of thinking as well. Nature provides important capital that we have available and that we cannot live without. And often we get for free. So if we start paying a little bit more and paying a little bit more attention to it, we probably can help enhance it and that will enhance the benefits that come back to us. And that's the conceptual underpinning of sustainability. And so I just want to end up by saying that we can all find our way to live with nature and it doesn't need to be the Anthropocene this can become the sustainer scene. Um, a few thanks. Thank you to my family and um, to my wife, Christine. Thank you to all my collaborators who've made the science that I've done possible because it's not just one person that does this. 
I want to thank the university promoters again. Thank you for coming tonight as well. I look forward to chatting with you. And I want to thank the Frankie Foundation as well for the opportunity to do this, to come to Belgium, to work with my colleagues at Kent University and to work with Hans Verbeek. And I'm very grateful to you, Hans, for also giving me the opportunity that we schemed here in uh, 2019 and have finally seen come to fruition. So thanks very much for listening.
congratulations. Dear Professor Ellsworth, dear David, thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. As you've rightfully shown, science is a central aspect of our society. Science not only gives us a better understanding of the world around us, it strengthens the everyday skills of problem solving and critical thinking. Advancing science and technology and cooperation is in the interest of the international community. Your presence here and the development of an inter-university training and discussion program unlocks huge potentials. And we want to thank you for all the efforts of coming here and making it possible. This award is all about promoting the development of higher education and scientific research. But at the same time, it's also about finding the best ambassadors for sustainability and for getting their voices heard. This way we can inspire others and stimulate the changes we need. On behalf of Kent University and Rector Rick van der Wallen, I have the honor to present to you the Ghent University Medal. This award is in recognition of your contributions to science and technology in the field of climate change. So we have another medal for you. Congratulations, uh, David, Professor Ellsworth. I wish you a very productive stay in Belgium. Uh, we heard from Hans that there's a lot of work for you today here, um, but it's, I think all these discussions, all these inspiring lectures and talks with students and researchers will really benefit for all of us, okay? So finally, I want to extend my congratulations to the promoter of the International Frankie Chair, Professor Hans Verbeek. The entire team behind the Frankie program. And of course, I want to thank the Frankie Foundation for the support and for creating this great opportunity to invite Professor Ellsworth to Ghent, to Belgium, and enabling a large group of people, researchers, students, to interact with him over a period of several months. Thank you. So I think we're going to close this session now, the official part. It is time for celebrations, and I wish to invite all of you to a reception which will be organized outside this room I want to close the session by thanking you for your attention and um, please join me in congratulating 
all the people here in the front and look forward to inspiring discussions over a glass of wine or whatever. Thank you.